an effective and favorite tactic of revolutionary protest against British actions was to boycott products in general from England. And the kinds of products that Americans were in the habit of buying from England tended to be domestic products, products for the household, textiles, tea, uh, uh, things that would be useful for not only men to use, but for women to use as well. And so there was a gendered dimension to the, to the boycotts, and women were asked to show their support and solidarity for the revolution by refusing to drink tea, by signing petitions that said they would not consume tea. Tea got invested with a lot of political meaning during the American Revolution. The Townsend duties had put taxes on a, an enumerated list of articles that were imported into the colonies. And in response to massive colonial civil disobedience around the issues of the, of the uh, Townsend duties, Britain removed all of them except for the tax on tea. And the tax on tea was maintained as a reminder that Britain had the right to tax the colonies. It wasn't particularly onerous, but it became a hot political issue again a few years later. The East India Tea Company was going broke. One of the reasons it was going broke was that Americans were not buying East India tea. Why weren't they buying it? Because there was a tax on East India tea, and to pay that would be admitting that they would accept taxation without representation. Britain manipulated the law yet again in order to create an economic advantage for a particularly favored tea company. They passed something known as the Tea Act, which uh, reformed the way that tea was brought into the colonies, made it cheaper to buy tea from England. Uh, the English assumed that if you could make them buy cheap tea, they would be willing to do it because they were convinced that all the colonists were cared about was pocketbook issues anyway. American patriots saw this as a bribe, which it was, uh, and as a result, uh, the Boston Tea Party occurred uh, and the beginning of the end really uh, was at hand. In New York City, a crowd of 2,000 stood in the rain to demonstrate support for a total ban on tea. In Philadelphia, the Sons of Liberty proclaimed any merchant trading East India tea an enemy to his country. In Charleston, mounds of unsold tea piled up because tea agents had abandoned their posts in fear. And in Boston, on the night of December 16, 1773, a group of men led by Samuel Adams dressed up as Mohawk Indians and sneaked aboard a cargo ship in Boston Harbor. There they spent three hours dumping 342 chests of tea into the drink. We were all throwing tea overboard. We catch someone in our party trying to stuff some of the tea in his pockets. He is stripped of his booty and his clothes and we send him home naked in disgrace. Then we went home in an orderly fashion. Boston enjoys the most peaceful night that it's had in many months. This was how George Hughes, one of the participants, remembered the Boston Tea Party. However, Lord Littleton of England saw it otherwise. Now, in the province of Massachusetts Bay, you have no government, no governor. You have only the proceedings of a tumultuous and riotous rabble. The British Parliament furious about the insurrection in Boston, passed a series of punitive measures known as the Coercive Acts. The colonists, however, dubbed them the Intolerable Acts. The Coercive Acts were passed specifically to get Boston in particular and Massachusetts in general. The English were furious at the Boston Tea Party. To be fair, a lot of American colonists were taken aback by it at first, until the coercive acts, and then they changed their minds and saw Bostonians as heroes. People looked at what happened to Massachusetts and said, man, if it can happen there, it can happen to us. We've got to do something about this. And as a result, they met at the First Continental Congress to try to figure out how to respond to the coercive acts. Committees of correspondence got the word out, and in September 1774, every colony except Georgia sent delegates to a Continental Congress in Philadelphia. During the seven-week-long meeting, the delegates passed a series of resolutions outlining what they perceived their rights to be. They resolved to boycott British goods, set up a Continental Association to enforce that resolution, and agreed to meet again the following spring for a second Continental Congress. 
the delegates, all leaders in their communities, were motivated by different objectives. The Massachusetts patriot Sam Adams wanted a full-scale denunciation of all parliamentary control of the colonies. By contrast, Joseph Galloway of Pennsylvania sought to cool the inflammatory talk of revolution and patch up relations with the mother country. George Washington, who had seen firsthand the vast promise of the land west of the Appalachians, was ready to raise and lead an army, if necessary at his own expense. The high-minded John Adams carried with him a vision of a new society based on merit rather than social status. But it was the great orator Patrick Henry who expressed the crucial idea that was fast becoming a reality. The distinction between Virginians and New Englanders is no more. I am not a Virginian, but an American. The movement towards colonial unity that had begun in Albany in 1754 was solidified with the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. In a mere 20 years, the players, the strategies they were willing to employ, and even the rules of the game had changed. As a result, a national consciousness had emerged. The colonists were no longer willing to be cast in the role of pawns. They saw themselves as knights prepared to do battle in the name of liberty even if this meant openly checking the authority of their king. The Albany Congress in 1754 was an attempt to unify the colonies in the threat of a serious war, but it didn't work. By 1774, we have moved through 20 years of increasing political activity, an increasing politicization of not just the leaders in the American colonies, but men in the streets as well, and women as well, who had participated in boycotts. There was a great deal more information available in print, in pamphlets, in newspapers, and through demonstrations about the constitutional issues at stake. Some sort of unification, loosely considered, seemed the only reasonable response to England. They saw themselves as Englishmen in 1754. By 1774, they were saying, we can't be virtually represented. We are too different from you. There are things about us that you don't understand. We don't trust you. And as a result, I think people were, if not ready for independence, certainly not ready to embrace England with that wholehearted sense of we're all in the same family that they had been 20 years earlier. I'd say that once Parliament decided in 1766 that its own dignity and prestige and power were at stake, and that this was a fundamental issue in terms of what it meant to be a British person, the American Revolution probably was inevitable, because by that point, most people on the western side of the Atlantic had a different understanding of being British than did people in Great Britain. In retrospect, things do look inevitable. Given the series of events, given the cultural attitudes of people on both sides, it's hard to look back and see a way out of this. There were statesmanlike proposals made to try to prevent the breakup of the empire, and they get rejected on both sides. If you were standing in 1765, you would not think an American Revolution was inevitable. Uh, by 1775, it clearly was inevitable, I think. And as we look back on it from our time today, boy, how could it have worked out differently?